Yeah, how's it been since episode one, which I have to say was very warmly received, particularly by my mother. She's very, she's very uh, encouraging. I had some really, really good feedback, right? I think uh, a lot of people found the conversations interesting and learned something. Uh, and this is from tech and non-tech people as well. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to today. And on our, our, the next conversation, just to see if we can build on that. If we can that. build on it, whether, whether we've still got the magic after one episode. Well, well, well listen, I, I, to, to, the, to those of you that are watching this on YouTube, um, Sanjay's having a bit of a lighting effect with his, the natural lighting coming in through. It's a bit of a halo effect for you, Sanjay, which is you know, not before time. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah, uh, yeah. Here, here's, here, here's something for you. I spotted on Sifted, which is a, a, a kind of online tech publication. I, I think it's Europe Focus, but I may be wrong. It may, it may be available. I'm sure it's available elsewhere, but I think it's Europe Focus. But anyway, they had a headline this week that said, are e-scooters stuck at the traffic lights? And it, and it, it made me think of a, of a massive tech fail that I had, which you might find quite amusing recently. So so Madrid, Madrid has gone all in on electric uh, self-transportation. So we've got electric cars, electric bicycles, we've got the e-scooters, and we've got my preferred choice, uh, which is the moped. Now, there are tons of brands. I, think, I don't know, there must be four, five, six of them. And, and as with everything, you end up with your favorite, right? So I got into a real rhythm of using, yeah, it was GoTo was the brand, or is the brand. And a very, very smooth process. I mean, I was fell in love with it, frankly. So you, you have your app, you you book you book your scooter. You've got fifteen yeah. minutes to get on the scooter. You you get there as soon as I spot it in the distance. I start to unlock the boot. So obviously yeah. not wanting to waste any time, so that I get to the boot of the scooter. It's already open for me. I get the helmet out. I put the phone in. I close the boot. Off I go. And I've spent two glorious years in Madrid with this very seamless process. Um, but go to then decided to go to another city. They decided to abandon Madrid. So I was like, okay, no problem, you know. So I, I got a new app and downloaded it. And in my office in Madrid, I thought, oh, I'm going to go and get a quick Starbucks, you know, classic kind of first world challenges I'm facing here. So I you know, walked out of my office, same process, with the app, 15 minutes, saw him in the distance, unlocked it, got my helmet out, put my phone in, closed the boot, off I went. Problem. With this particular app, you have to have your phone out of the boot because that's the only way you can open it. So I now found myself with scooter, but with phone inside scooter and locked inside scooter, right? And and again, it exposes that ridiculous uh, fact that that you know without your phone you're kind of completely lost because I couldn't I couldn't call anybody to help. I was now outside my office. I couldn't get hold of of, of Maya, my wife, to, to say, "Can you ring these guys up and say I'm stuck?" <laughs> it was an absolute fiasco, and it took me an hour and a half to eventually unravel this. By, by going back to the office, getting my computer, coming to my computer, getting the Wi-Fi from my phone that was inside the computer. Oh, gosh. So, you know, the, the headline. Did you, did you manage to get your coffee or were you going to pay using your phone as well so you didn't get your coffee? Either? Coffee coffee was abandoned. Starbucks lost <laughs> another four euros of my well-earned money. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a great example of tech. For, you know, when technology fails you, and you're so reliant on it and so kind of just – you don't even think it's not going to work. Then suddenly you're kind of completely discombobulated. I mean, yeah. how are you? How are you with your? You've got you're, so, you're on a big. So transportation is really interesting, right? So um, I've got my tech anxiety. So big tech user. I'd like to say I'm you know ahead of the curve with most things. So naturally got a, an electric vehicle. Um, had one for the best part of the year. Um, but we're doing as a family our first road trip. So we're, I live in the Midlands in the UK and we're driving up to Scotland to see one of my closest friends. So it's a 300 mile trip one way. And I've got this anxiety of, you know, the route charging, you know, where are we going to stop? Am I going to make it if I get stuck in traffic or it gets cold that drains the battery some more? So I, I've, I've not, I'm hoping I'm not going to have a tech failure, um, but I have um, Google Maps. I've downloaded the, the maps for each of the parts of the routes. I've used Zap Map to, to find all my the charges en route. Um, so I'm, I'm using a lot of tech for what normally I would have just kind of jumped in the car, filled up, uh, filled up the tank with some diesel or something and gone. And, and it's really interesting how I'm having to use a lot of tech 
And, you know, the, the really interesting thing that you said was, you know, you know, it was your phone that kind of let you down because you put it in the boot. And I'm, I've got the same anxiety. Everything is on my phone. So it's, I can see it next to me. It's not leaving my side through, through for this journey. But yeah. But yeah. It's, 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 the- fun, it's, it's funny as well, your phrase tech anxiety, isn't it? it, 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 it you know, it, 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 everything is so seamless and so tech enabled these days. But the anxiety of if it doesn't work, you know, it's a bit like charging the phone. It's a very basic, obvious thing, isn't it? But yeah, yeah. no, the, so tech fails what we have had, I think should be our intro. To, uh, think, to each of these episodes so we, we'd, have so we'd have a lot we'd just to see how you get on at the next uh, episode yeah. so uh, yeah. ahead of us we've got uh we've got the fireside chat we've got a wonderful guest julian costley who's going to join us uh shortly sanjay with you uh but first uh, the world's first tech readers quiz you really really need to get out more all right welcome and to those unfamiliar with this section of the podcast we we all spend far too long at our desks, behind our monitors, with our keyboards, etc. So CTO Academy are here to encourage people to get out more with $50, 50 US dollars. I know that's not necessarily relevant to our European quiz guests here, but you know, uh, the exchange rate isn't too bad at the moment, particularly in the UK. So we give $50 $50 to the winner of our quiz uh, for them to go out, to get out more, to a nominated restaurant of their choice. Steve Van Niekirk down in Johannesburg won episode one, and he has been dining out at Luthio's Pizzeria in Johannesburg. And the last episode was the CTO head-to-head. This episode, it's a heads of engineering head-to-head, if that makes sense. Welcome, Bianca Glasner and Morgan Davis. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having us. Fantastic. Well, we love our volunteers in these early episodes. So we'd love to know a little bit more about uh, what you're doing, the company that you're working with, and maybe any achievements, challenges. Bianca, tell us a bit more about yourself. Sure. So once again, hi, my name is Bianca, and I'm really happy to today's uh, session. Uh, as Andrew already mentioned, I work as a head of engineering for a company called Phytologic. You can see it also in my background, I guess. <laughs> so uh, what are we actually doing within uh, Phytologic? Um, do you know that situation when you desperately search a product in an online shop and you cannot find what you were looking for? Instead, you have a tons of products uh, that aren't relevant for you. So that's where we come into action. Uh, for e-commerce businesses, Findologic uh, provides a search and navigation platform powered with AI that understands um, a user's intent um, for e-commerce businesses. So with the uh, with the motto, we're following um, if they can find it, they can buy it. Uh, we strive to provide the best search uh, solution for our customers and for their end users. So it happens uh, to me quite often in my private life that uh, my friends and family ask me, but Bianca, what are you doing? (laughs) And I always try to explain it uh, with this, uh, with this example. And also my, my role for some not tech oriented uh, people is not that easy to understand. But in my current role as a head of uh, engineering, I operationally uh, manage the engineering team. Uh, or the engineering department uh, to develop our great pro- uh, products together in our team. So um, I'm basically responsible for the timely and qualitative uh, implementation of our OKRs, um, the maintenance of the products, and the operation of our architecture. Within our engineering team, I have uh, the honor to lead 20 amazing software engineers, uh, DevOps engineers, and web developers, and data scientists. And I also have the uh, role as a product owner, where it is my task um, to increase the value of our product. So what are actually some challenges uh, we have at the moment? Um, So the company uh, which I'm working for, Findologic, um, has recently joined forces with another company. So at the moment, my main challenge or main challenges are the migration um, of our engineering team and our tech. Um, in order to develop a tech and product strategy where we can succeed together. So as you can imagine, it's not a thing that can be done in one day. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I have to um, deal with these new scenarios. I'm really uh, looking forward to it. I'm super hyped, yeah. (laughs) But first of all, we have to uh, manage our team, their team, our product and their product. Besides, yeah, 
I got a quick quick sure. question. So with that yeah. migration, what uh, what what would be really interesting to know is is do you think the challenge is going to be a technical challenge or actually a challenge of personalities as the two teams merge? So you know because yeah. you know as techies we're quite precious of what we have built, right? It's like our baby. Um, so wh- where where do you see that challenge coming? So personally, I do not see any challenge when it uh, comes to the culture. So we are uh, the culture from our company and their company is uh, the state uh, is like the same. We are open, um, open company culture where everyone uh, can con- contribute uh, to the success of the companies and everyone is welcome. So we felt uh, quite welcome from uh, day zero. Uh, so they handled us uh, already like family members. <laughs> so it's really cool. Uh, but when it comes to the product, um, there are some opportunities, uh, but also some uh, weaknesses, let's say. So, for example, we step in. They have another core product, let's say, uh, which we were missing um, in the past. So we wanted to develop that as a next step. And they are already in a super stage uh, there. But what they are missing is our product, so the search product within their platform. They already have um, a product for it in place, but we are more advanced uh, as they are, and also our tech is already more advanced. So the big challenge here will be, um, do we uh, further improve the the product they already have within uh, search with our insights, with our tech, or are we trying to migrate our product directly into their product? And these are those kind of challenges we are facing right now together. Perfect. Thank you for sharing. Awesome. Right. Thanks, Bianca. And, and, and I know based in Salzburg and also quite heavily connected with the local tech makers, Google yeah, and, and exactly. women tech makers. Fantastic. Exactly. All right. Well, listen, great great to see you. Thank you for joining. And, and Morgan, uh, waiting for us down in, in, on the south coast of England, one of my favorite spots of Brighton. Uh, nice to see you. Give us a bit more background to yourself. Sure. So my name's Morgan. I'm head of engineering at Capital Pilot. Uh, Capital Pilot exists to help funders, sorry, help founders get access to funding. Um, as engineering leaders, we can sometimes be a little bit insulated from what CEOs have to go through to get funding. It's kind of it's basically a full time job, uh, <laughs> all in, all encompassing. Um, as the industry currently works, it's somewhat innately biased and unfair. And what Capital Pilot is trying to do is streamline it, make it so that you've got time for other things in your day, and um, add a bit of objectivity to to that system. So the way we do that is chiefly through our ratings. We've created an investability rating where you uh, give us a bit of information about your company, about your pitch, and how you aim to get funding, and we will give you a score that kind of indicates where, how likely you are to get funding, and we include some feedback as well about what you need to do to then improve your chances. Um, we also then have a fund which invests solely on the basis of that rating. Uh, we were recently listed by Bohurst as one of the most active investors in the UK, which we're really happy about. Uh, the, in terms of challenges, there was a really good conversation yesterday in the CTO Academy Slack, which started off, I don't know if you saw this one actually, maybe you did, started off about how to get more done and it evolved into a conversation around prioritization. Um, I'm keen that as we as are, we are an early stage company ourselves, it's absolutely important that we're prioritizing our work for the most valuable lessons we can learn. Um, I think I've used the term optimizing our team for learning rather than for actually getting the work done. Um, Having said that, though, it does need to be balanced with work around, you know, compliance or more incremental features. And that's not an easy balancing act to maintain as you continue growing and those priorities constantly shift and, you you know, subject to different influences. Do you, do you have a specific tool that you use to help with that prioritization or like a, or a technique? Uh, quite interesting to know what, what, what part of the journey you're on at the moment. Yeah. So I've spoken a few times, again, in in the Slack channel, I've spoken about techniques um, used by companies like ThoughtWorks that they list in Edge. Um, And there are a few different things, you know, things like Moscow, things like um, even just a simple bubble sorting or backlog is very, very useful. But what, what I tend to see is that 
that lends itself very easily to feature delivery work. But some of the more constraint-driven stuff around, for example, compliance, doesn't lend itself so well to that approach. So that's that's where that challenge is, finding the framework, finding the, the mechanism that helps us give that the proper precedence without... Uh, you know, without saying, right, down to six months, we're just going to work on technical debt and nothing else, and we're not going to get any features done, which, although may feel good for the first few weeks, very quickly you start to think, why haven't we actually done, you know, we haven't got anything out there for the customers lately, and that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> Thank you. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, search and funding are both kind of top of my list with CTO Academy, so I've been, you're both in areas that I know quite <laughs> a lot about, but not enough, probably. Uh <laughs> Sanjay's going to drop off. A couple of quick things. That, that, that One thing that Morgan hasn't mentioned is that he is about to become a dad at any moment. So we've added a, a clause to the quiz rules that any sudden exit in mid-quiz, Morgan, we're going to split the winnings. Bianca has very kindly agreed to that additional <laughs> clause. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and also, have you both got a, a nominated restaurant that's going to be the beneficiary of this 50 loss, Bianca? Yes, I nominated um, a restaurant called Die Weisse. It's an old brewery directly in the city center of Salz uh, in Salzburg, uh, where can, you can have uh, delicious local food and, of course, beer. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of beer. Fantastic. Morgan, in Brighton, anywhere that you've nominated? Well, do you know... I thought I might try a place called the Oak Barn in Burgess Hill. So since we last spoke, I've actually moved out to Burgess Hill. Um, I've lived here for a reasonable while now and I've never been there, despite it being really well reviewed. So depending when the baby turns up, it might be a case of leaving him with the grandparents and getting a, a well-needed breath of air. Perfect. Thank you, for, thank you for that. Thank you for joining us. Right. We have three questions. You'll be familiar with the format. I've got them all listed here. I'm going to uh-huh. shuffle them, no particular order. Bianca, I've now got my questions in order of one, two, three. One. Give me a number. Let's pick three. Three. Oh, nice. That's my favourite, which is who am I? So first, <laughs> if you don't think you know the answer, call out your name. Uh, Sanjay will be my arbitrator if I have any confusion, which is quite likely. But let's go. So this is a person who was born 1815, died in 1852, both in London. She was the only legitimate child of Lord and Lady Byron. She was an English mathematician and writer. Her work on Charles Babbage's proposed mechanical general purpose computer oh, no. called the analytical engine. I could see you both thinking it's there. It's, it's gone. gone. Yeah, it's gone. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. She described, I'm going to do a final bit because I don't think you're going to get it. She described her approach as poetical, poetical science and herself as analyst and metaphysician. Okay, I tried. Go. Uh, Bianca, Grace Hopper? No, no, no. it's not. <laughs> I, think Grace, I think Grace was this, this was the last century, not long before. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Morgan. No, I have no idea. The audience is waiting with bated breath. Burg- Burgess Hill has never been in the spotlight as much as this moment. Quite, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is it. This is our moment. Um, I'm going to have to. No I'm going to have to force you it's, into it. It's answer. gone. Yeah, it's gone. Uh, do you know what you're going to say? You, the name. I'm going to kick myself. Go on. You're, you're going to kick yourself many times. Ada Lovelace. Yes, yes, I am going to kick myself many times. <laughs> so, so listen. This the audience are very excited because there's absolutely zero score. So Morgan, one or two? Uh, let's go for two. Two. Okay. Now these these next two are very very simple. I I think, but I say that. <laughs> After your failure with the first one, this may be a struggle, but I think they're relatively <laughs> straightforward. So, what year was the iPhone launched? <laughs> I should know Sanjay. that. Sanjay, Sanjay we're of another generation, aren't we? we? We know the answer to this. Yeah, I'm hoping you go first so you can rule one year out. <laughs> then I can have all the other years to pick from. <laughs> I'm gonna to have to. I'm gonna to have to grab a, an answer from one or both of you. Just go for it. It's and let me give you I a clue. It's, it's more. It's more than fifteen years. What's more than fifteen years? Oh, it was more than fifteen years, years ago. ago. Launched. Okay. Bianca, I tried. Um, 2011. No. I I think it was earlier than that. I think it was. I'm gonna go for two. 
Oh, my, my, account, my, my accountant is going to be so pleased that we don't have to spend this $50. 2007. Yeah. 2007 oh, is the answer. 2007, no. <laughs> no. I was worried about that because I thought you two have probably never lived without an iPhone. Do you or, know? Or no, no, no. I, I, was, I was Windows phone up to the end. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. All right. I am, I am troubled. Now, listen, if we end up with no score, I, I, I'm going to split the winning. So you might, you might just want to sit on the fence <laughs> on this one. But this is the final one. Okay. What is the name of the current CEO of Alphabet? <laughs> no. I don't know. I mean, you know, I can I can picture door. the fella, but I can't I can't uh, name right. him. No. Well, I can tell you that there is an old brewery in Salzburg and the old barn in Burgess Hill who are both going to both going to benefit from the splitting of this. But it's Sundar Sundar Pichai. I hope I pronounced his surname correctly. Yeah, but, but I do is... not know how to pronounce it. <laughs> no, well, listen, listen. That was a fantastic failure, and and the, re the the day can only get better for both of you. But thank you both <laughs> for joining us. So there we are. Well, uh, I mean, Sandra, it wasn't the most successful quiz, but it was fun. Well, you've got to learn from your failures. So I thought it was fantastic, right? <laughs> well, thank you, Bianca and Morgan, wonderful stars and great members of our community. And now another friend of CTO Academy, a serial entrepreneur, CEO at enterprise level, at startup level. I've lost count of how many boards he's on. I think it's 26 was the last count. Mentor at London Business School, but also, also a very popular lecturer on our executive leadership course here at CTO Academy, not just for the lectures themselves, but he was also voted as having the best introductory sentence to a lecture. Sanjay, can I tell you what it was? Come on, then, let's hear it. And I quote from, from Julian's uh, lecture on uh, how to be effective at uh, executive level. Of all the jobs I've done over the years, only one was understood by my mother. Julian Costley, which one? Uh, well, it was, the, um, it was the job that I had when I was bureau chief and country manager for Reuters. And uh, I was posted to Israel, responsible for Israel, West Bank and Gaza. And it was the time of the Intifada. But I, I, it, she looked as if she understood for the first time with all the complicated jobs I'd done before that she understood that. And then I heard from my sister that she told a neighbour that I had something to do with news and getting shot at. <laughs> lovely. Wonderful. Well, it's a lovely, it's a, it's a great lecture, wonderful opening line. And thank you for joining us uh, for what I think is going to be a particularly fascinating fireside chat with Sanjay. I will leave you both to it. Julian, thanks for joining. Hope you enjoy the fire. Hope you enjoy the chat. So, Julian, you are a seasoned CEO, seasoned chairman. Uh, you've been on many, many boards, and I'm really excited about this conversation. So I think the um, axis between a CEO and a CTO is becoming more and more important as yeah. more new businesses are technology-focused. So I think this conversation is really interesting, especially for myself. Um, so I'm going to jump into the, the, the question. So my first one really is around um, the good, the bad and the ugly in terms of how, you know, your relationships with the CTOs that you've had over your career. Yeah. OK. Well, I mean, it's easy to think of the good one because that almost certainly came as a result of um, starting up the um, uh, stock working company E-Trade UK and the reason it was good is that we had so much money <laughs> we we our startup capital was absolutely massive and uh you can hire some very good people you know when when, when you don't have to compromise you know when financial services is peculiarly expensive uh, UK is London is you know everything although we set it up in Cambridge it was it was the center of gravity of of technology as you know so um uh, a lot of competition for really good people, but have some really good people. And I suppose the reason that it worked well, you know, why why I would call that one a good one, is that um, when you've got really competent people, uh, you can get on with your own job as a chief executive. You know, they they the guy that we had there was um, an absolute grown up. You know, arrived from a senior position in another company and and went okay. There's probably probably more bads than uglies. Sanjay, you know, than than um, than the goods, I have to say, but that's usually because, you know, some some you know, 
fatal flaw that you you know you don't know when you hire somebody sort of emerges. So probably the um, the bad one I think was when we were setting up um, uh, France Telecom, a uh, satellite company, Globecast, uh, and I was the founding uh, chief executive and setting it up. It was originally a joint venture with Maxwell Communications, and um, uh, we didn't have an office. <laughs> it was literally. Uh, a, a broadcast license and a lot of money in the bank. Literally, I was first employee. So I remember that we um, there was a pub in Fetter Lane. And um, that's when I did all my interviews. So <laughs> the guy that I hired, um, it probably wasn't a good idea. It was over a lot of drinking in the pub. Uh, <laughs> I probably made the decision too quickly and, and took him on board. And, and why was it bad? Uh, because uh, we outgrew him. You know, we had to go from nothing to right. you know, satellite farms and whatever, and it was just simply that, despite you know really looking after him and nurturing him and whatever, you know he ran out of steam. So that was a bad. Um, I've definitely got an ugly, uh, and that was when when um, uh, I took over as in, interim chief executive of a Dutch consulting company. A couple of guys yeah. came out of McKinsey's. They they set it up, and um, we were at Ealing Studios in the UK. If if anybody knows that. And um, fantastic location to run a company. But I came in, we had 24 staff, and pretty quickly with a group CEO, I realized we needed to get rid of 16 of them. Wow. So um, on the list was the CTO, because he was a sort of bolshy, difficult character, and I had to, yeah. had to let him go anyway. So I hired a little room about 100 meters from uh, our main offices, and I interviewed every member of staff and told them, you know, wh which ones were going to be uh, staying, wh whatever. But we knew the CTO, you know, talk about ugly uh, problem. Uh, we knew the CTO was going to be a problem. So we, the deputy CTO, uh, and I arranged that in the 20 minutes that I had him, at, you know, uh, for the interview, and I had a call to say, no, we're not ready yet. We cancelled and changed all the passwords, all the locks absolutely everything so that um by the time he got back to the office i told him you know he hadn't got the job yeah uh, uh yeah he was very angry i've ever had I, I, you know, it's never gone as badly wrong as that and uh you know with difficult people but anyway anyway there's your, there's your answer too uh, I, I mean that's really nice uh, and, and lo lots of extremes there so that that's you know yeah, uh really insightful yeah um, I, 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 where I want to go next is um, I'm hoping most people don't get the ugly side of the relationship, you know, or, or hopefully don't get to experience that. And, you know, quite often, you know, it's somewhere in the middle, um, you know, the relationship between the CEO and the CTO. And I, I guess, you know, one of the reasons why it's, you know, in, in my head, one of the reasons why it's somewhere in the middle in terms of that relationship is, the personalities are very different because, you know, where your functional focus is very, very different. Your backgrounds, your experiences, your drives and motivations actually within the within the organization are very, very different. And, and I think that drives that, you know, I'm going to call it friction. Um, yeah, I guess yeah. how, you know, how do you build that relationship? You know, because again, uh, you know, it does sound like that that relationship is in, important. You know, you especially when you spoke about the good. You know, you could trust the CTO; they got on with it, allowed you to focus. And the ugly, you knew you had to let them go because they weren't executing where where you needed them to. So, how do you, you know, from as, from a CEO perspective, um, how, you know, uh, you know, how do you how do you build that relationship? What's what's the how do you exercise that muscle, I guess? You know, what, what do you need to go through? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, there's a lot of expressions, and I, I guess, you know, there's, there's nothing sort of new under the sun, as it were. The, 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 the key word is probably honesty, you know, is um, it, it, building a relationship with someone has got to be totally based on, on trust, obviously. So if you're starting a new relationship with somebody, um, rather than the person having, you know, be, being a manager or a software developer or whatever it might be, and they, they've mm -hmm. moved up, you promoted them into the position, and you want them to start thinking a little bit differently about it. Um, that's a different setup than you hire somebody, they come in, you don't know each other, all you 
pretty much have got is the you know what you've learned from the interview and and from their CV, and I, I and you know the mechanics of it really are um, starting with setting out uh, your own objectives. I'm talking from a CEO's position now. You know yeah. what 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 are you trying to achieve in business terms? And uh, you know another corny expression, but it's really important metaphorically to be sitting on the same side of the table so you, it, it's not an antagonistic it's not too much demand from the ceo and then too much you know hold back from the uh, cto um it really helps if you set up what you're trying to do commercially but the honesty bit comes in um on both sides actually but from a cto what i would look for with a cto is uh, all the stuff that you know, Sanjay, you and I know about that everybody does in a company, which is a bit of sandbagging. So you can, yeah. you know, you can sandbag on budgets. Oh, we're going to need another developer, or, you know, for next year or whatever it be. And you can sandbag on timescales. So you know, if you've if you've got sort of n hours of of dev time, you know, to achieve an objective, uh, yeah. of course, you always end up with somebody saying, "Oh no, we're going to need you know five more hours for that." and and the slippage or the delivery time is sort of uh, slipped on it, or you need more resources, or, or, or you know whatever it might be. So getting getting to that point where you you're really honest with each other, but but it, it, it works the other way. I think it's perfectly reasonable for the CTO to delve a little bit, you know, maybe challenge the CEO and say, really, you know. Do you really need that? Are you sandbagging? Are you telling me a delivery date that marketing want, for example, that really doesn't matter, you know, that much? And you're building in something. So that that's um, that's really important. And there's a couple of sort of no nos and things that um, destroy trust and destroy the relationship. You know, if you're working well, and one of them is um, you should never um, never use group meetings. To embarrass the CTO, you know, to put the—I mean, I'm talking about you know um, CEO's position. Ne- never um, build a conflict, and you think, well, I, I'm going to put pressure in the group meeting. You know, sort of whether it's the board if they're on the board, if the CTO is yeah. on the board. But even in weekly management meetings, you know, don't don't hold back a nasty, you know, to to do that. But equally, it works the other way. You know that um, uh, you know the CTO. It just happens, unfortunately, but it, it's not good for the relationship. Is where somebody would um, the CTO would use that sort of meeting to put pressure. You know, like, um, well, I think, I think, you know, we all think this, don't we? You know, invoking the power of the rest of the executive team, you know, to get their own way. But um, I think we've used the expression already uh, in this conversation. I think it's about um, metaphorically being around the same side of the table. Yes. You know, sort of. Um, yeah. And enthusiasing, enthusing the um, the CTO towards the objective, and making them partially own outside their box or, or vertical, you know, of of you know technology and and uh, t- uh, technology strategy, of of feeling that they partially own um, the outcome that the CEO is driving, you know. So if if you if you feel that you're working towards something, you're less likely to. Uh, disown it or, or blame other people or, or whatever it would be. So, so probably all of that. But I, I would say honesty is the core. Building I, I, a, a, a I really like love that. it. And, and, and actually your point about being, we are on the same side of the table. I think it really rings a bell for me. So one of my practices, and, and you mentioned the, you know, you, you don't want a CTO coming to the exec table and the weekly meeting and announcing something that no one's ever heard of. And, you know, one of my practices is, you know, on a regular basis, when I have my one-to-one catch up with a, with a CEO, I've always kind of informed them first and I've given them a heads up. I've kind of said, hey, we've got this on the horizon or we've got this disaster. I'm going to bring it up in the exec session, but, you know, please be aware. And, you know, the relationship that you build by doing that is they often give you a steer. Um, in how to manage yourself within the exec meeting because they'll know the personalities around the room better than yourself, maybe. Um, and it does drive a better conversation in, in an exec yeah, session. Yeah, yeah. Completely yeah. agree with you. I think that's yeah, you know yeah. really, really insightful. Um, so, so interestingly takes us on to um, if, we, if we're honest with each other, so if I'm the CTO and you're the CEO, 
Um, do we need to be friends? Do I, as a CTO, do I need to go and have a drink with you or am I okay um, doing what I want, you know, playing my games or, you know, socializing however I want, you know, what, what, what's, what's your opinion of that? Um, I, I, I think uh, <laughs> with no dis- disrespect to our audience, but sometimes, um, well, if I take two, two contrasting positions in an executive management team, let's say uh, 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 the, uh, the marketing director or the sales director and the CTO, um, there is a tendency, how can I put it diplomatically, um, to be sort of quite insular. If, if you're yeah. totally focused on, on technology, you may be less uh, gregarious, you know, you, you may be uh, 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 possibly less sociable. Uh, I mean, that's less and less the case, obviously, when somebody becomes more senior, they, they grow, you know, in, in, yeah. in their ability to, to communicate. But I think, um, I, I don't think there's a formula. I mean, I, I do love formula. I love lists, a sort of check, checklists of things that you should do with people. But I, I, I have uh, liked and I have, you know, sort of uh, taken people for a beer. But, but I think it's probably um, politics management more than anything. Yeah, I don't think you need to be a friend, but I do think you need to understand, but particularly very much nowadays, where a proportion, one of the companies I'm on the board of currently, the CTO only comes in once a week. Um, yeah. And you think, how on earth does he manage a team? And, um, well, we've set it up and it really works very well, but you, you, there isn't the same interaction with somebody where, where you don't have sort of personal contact with them. So sometimes uh, going for a drink is important because it, it, although it's none of your business, what's going on in their private life, knowing the influences that are uh, driving them or, or weighing down on them, you know, out, outside the office is probably quite important. You know, and, and nobody's going to walk into your office, you know, you know, despite open door policy and actually say, I think you should know, you know, my daughter's having trouble with her children or whatever. And I'm having to do a lot of babysitting or, you know, wh- whatever it might be. I don't know. Uh, and um, uh, because of that, I think it's it's good to spend a bit of time on it. But um, really, it, you know, anything that um, fosters a good uh, communication, you know, sort of open yeah. communication you'd want somebody to feel that they could say anything to you, don't you? you know I mean, you know, yeah. they've got to be able to not hold anything back. But um, I suppose the, you know, just, just leading on from that is you don't need to be friends. You do need to have a trusting relationship and you don't want them to be frightened of you. You know, you, yeah. you, 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 if, if you've hired somebody, they tend to spend the whole of the period in which they're working in a, in, a, in a hierarchical idea, this is the person who gave me the job. This is the person who can decide if I stay. And you do what you know. You do have to have that authority, but you do want to level it up to a certain extent. Yeah. And I, I think if there's a singular thing that can go wrong that a good relationship will rectify is um, surprises. Yes. It's the worst thing, you know, of, as a CEO is to. Uh, feel well for two things really one is surprises which is obviously not telling you about something because they think they can fix it before you even get to hear about it um, which yeah. is really bad news and the other one is um, upward delegation mm-hmm. you know I mean when you hire what you want of a senior person is that they um, uh, they feel that they can manage stuff they're a grown up they're doing what they need to do and they, they're not passing problems up to you you know they, yes. they are they they're bringing making aware of of a of a problem that might grow might be difficult but they tend to come with um a solution so it's yes. a good relationship you know you're not dealing with oh god x is coming through my door again you know yeah. i know what this is going to be they can't solve a problem and it's going to be mission critical um you, you you look positively on the person because yeah. you're thinking that they're coming with a solution. So I probably over explained it, but you know what I mean. You know, I guess what I'm hearing, so the kind of the real takeaway for me is, um, no, you don't need to be friends, but you need a relationship. Yeah. Um, so it being just transactional is not good enough if, if, if you want to excel and grow, you know, as an organization, as a, as a management team. So 
there needs to be a relationship more than just a transactional relationship. So um, I, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, yeah, no, that's well yeah, said. Exactly. Yeah. You know, if the friendship builds, it builds. And if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But a relationship is important. So, yeah, good. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to ask you one last question, uh, Julian. So <laughs> okay. right. um, you have so much experience, right, working with CTOs. It sounds like you've you've worked with many, many. And one of the things... I'm going to uh, try to get out of you is what's the one bit of career advice that you would give to our, you know, the, the audience listening um, yeah. to kind of help with their career in tech, their career to be a CTO or a great CTO. So what's the one, one critical bit of advice? Um, well, the, 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 the word uh, being a grown up, uh, you know, comes to mind, but, uh, but I think, um, it, 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 from my observation of people, as they as the organisation is growing, then every senior executive, including the CTO, obviously needs to grow with it. And um, it, you know, it, it, my advice is you can't be running stand ups anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah. all the things that in your comfort zone uh, that were to do with um, you know uh, the technology and whatever. It, you you still got to be in control, but you've got to move on because you're now, as a CTO or growing into a CTO, you're now responsible for, you know, you can imagine the Zen diagram, you know, you're not just there on your own. You overlap on all the other operational factors in a company, including the strategy and, and where you're going. So a simple thing is probably recognizing yourself, uh, if I was the CEO, and I was looking back at me, do I really need to be doing these things? You know, are there a lot of things I should be delegating? And should I be moving on up and um, concentrating on the things that uh, a top uh, CTO does? Sorry, it's a very long answer, Sanjay. No, no, it was great. I, I mean, there was, there was uh, lots of wisdom there, art of delegation, oh, okay. well, well, growing okay. up, growing and learning. I like it. Uh, we, did, we didn't get one, we got three or four. So, Julian, okay. thanks. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Really, really appreciate You're it. Welcome. Lovely to chat with you, like always, um, and hopefully speak soon. Very good. Thank you. Hi, Sanjay. Well, I mean, Julian never fails to deliver, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, really yeah. interesting. In conversation. Yeah, re really fascinating. And, and as I mentioned in the introduction to Julian, he's he does a number of lectures in our exec leadership course, and all of them are absolutely fantastic and, and, and very, very popular. So wonderful. Listen, we're going to wrap up with a couple of things. The first one, of course, is our incredibly popular around the tech world in 80 seconds. We're going to be joined by uh, Frederic Rincones from Medellin. Have you been to Medellin, Sanjo? I don't. I am going to Google where that is now. <laughs> well, I tell you now, at the end of this with Freddie, you're going to definitely want to go. But here we are. Let's go for around the tech world in 80 seconds. And welcome, Freddie Rincones, to Around the Tech World in 80 Seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great to see you. Right. We're going to uh, turn the spotlight on Medellin. So, Phil, start the clock. Freddie, tell us about you. I'm Freddie Rincones. I'm from Venezuela. I'm the founder for TDX. That is, uh, we support the digital transformation in the companies and live here in Medellin. F fantastic. What kind of companies are making Medellin home? Are the big one, the big one companies like uh, Accenture, like a uh, Globan, as well like a uh, Capgemini, um, uh, NTT, Everys, and, and and other ones. It's a a good place for the good companies. Beautiful. And what are the local events and support network going on? Uh, uh, there are a lot of local events like uh, DevOps, like um, Beamware. Uh, the big companies always try to use Medellin for uh, good events, and as well there are some government programs that help uh, the rest of company to this networking is great good. And, and if i'm an international client international customer looking in on this podcast why why should i use a colombian tech company um you know uh here the colombia tech company always support the software development projects and the consulting it consulting projects and manage services projects they always try to to support the different kind of solution it solutions Okay, five words, Medellin. Why is it so great? Innovation, technology, as well, gastronomic, nature, and people. I think there are all those five questions. <laughs> <laughs>
I think it was done. I, 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 think, I, I think we did that in 85 seconds, but I don't mind. The audience doesn't care. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Freddie, Amazing. thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and I will be coming to Medellin very soon. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, happy to be everybody here, here, and and that's it. Welcome to Medellin. Okay, Sanjay, I think I think we're both going to Medellin now, aren't we? Thank that's you, Andrew, for <laughs> Wonderful. Well, listen, thank you, everybody, for watching uh, episode two. We hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to finish, actually. I, I haven't warned Sanjay about this, but very briefly, the, the whole concept of me, my CTO, and I uh, emerged. We've been talking about a podcast, haven't we, for a while, but the actual idea and the format emerged when I was traveling on a train from Madrid to Malaga and I, and I it was just me and a, and a rapidly um, emptying bottle of Rioja um, yeah. which meant which meant that I kind of threw uh, some of the ideas were very surreal and Sanjay knocked most of them out of the park um, but I did suggest doing the occasional limerick at Sanjay so I'm going to leave you I'm going to leave you with my first limerick okay. and, and see and see how well received or not uh, this is but thank you all very much for watching uh, and I'd like to leave you uh, with this. A CTO was dreaming in Nantucket of pushing her CEO into the nearest bit bucket. You must stop interfering as the launch date is nearing or the team will resign and say, fuck it. <laughs> you got a tech reference in. Amazing. <laughs> Me, my CTO and I was a CTO Academy production with special thanks to Sanjay Mystery, Julian Costley, Bianca Glasner, Morgan Davis, Freddie Rincones, a new our audience. Until next time, gracias y hasta luego.